can have a seat. Uh, at this time, uh, Mr. Owens, I think you are moving to amend the information out of count nine. Is that correct? That's correct, Your Honor. Based right. on the uh, admission of guilt as to the uh, felony sexual battery related to Jane Doe 1. Okay, so at this time you move the court to allow the amendment of the information to add a count nine, which is violation of Penal Code Section 243.4, sexual battery with an offense date of March 17, 2018 with the victim being Jane Doe number one, a 54-year-old woman. Is that correct? That is correct, and it would be the Penal Code Section 243.4, subsection A. Okay, all right. And the uh, court will allow that amendment. Is there any objection by the defense? No, yeah. Okay. With that said, then, the uh, count nine has been added to the information. And uh, Mr. Winslow, I'm going to ask you a series of questions, all right? I've gone over your change of plea form. Have you had any uh, drugs or alcohol or any narcotics at all within the last 24 hours? No, I don't. All right. I have a, in my hand a change of plea form. It's four pages long. And on this change of plea form, there are some initials on the right-hand side of the pages and a signature on the third page. Is this your signature? And are these your initials on this change of plea form? Yes, sir. All right. Before you signed and initialed this form, did you have a chance to read what was on the form? Yes. And did you discuss the contents of this form with your attorneys? Yes. Do you thoroughly understand the contents of this form? Yes. And were you able to thoroughly discuss the contents of this form with your attorneys? Yes. Right. And I know we've had a long lunch hour. You spent the last, well, about two and a half hours talking to your attorneys. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Is that been enough time for you to make a, an informed decision about your decision today? Because the, the option is to go to trial. We have jurors out there waiting to start with opening statements in about 10 minutes. So have you had enough time to thoroughly discuss this with your attorneys? Yes, yes, Your Honor. Okay. Well, I noticed you looked into the audience. I'm asking you. I'm not asking anybody else because, sir, this is your decision and your decision alone. I think you understand that. Have you had enough time to discuss this? And, uh, you, and you've also discussed it with your family as well, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. All right. Uh, the form indicates that you are pleading guilty to counts six, which is violation of Penal Code Section 261A4, as well as the added count nine, and the stipulated state prison term would be a range from 12 to 18 years. Is that your understanding of the plea agreement? Yes, yes, Your Honor. All right. And also, that you would waive your appellate rights with respect to the charges that you have previously been convicted on with respect to Jane Doe number three, Jane Doe number two, and Jane Doe number four, which were, were reflected in the verdicts on June 11th of this year. Do you understand that? That's Jane Doe number five, Your Honor, not four. I'm sorry. That's right. Jane Doe number five. Do you understand that? Yes. Okay, so you would be pleading guilty to two charges today and the prior convictions from the first trial those verdicts that were read on June 11th of this year would stand and you would waive your appellate rights on those charges. Is that your understanding of the agreement? Yes, Your Honor. All right. And the balance of the uh, information would be dismissed. Is that your full understanding of the agreement that you're entering into at this time? Yes. Have any other promises been made to you to get you to plead guilty today? Uh, I believe that the verdicts, uh, finding the guilty verdicts, were actually recorded on June 10th of 2019, if I just remember correctly. And the mistrial was declared on June 11th. That might be the case. The, the change of plea form says June 11th. Let me take a look at the verdict form.
those verdicts were taken on June 10th. And recorded on that day, so I'm going to change the 11th to the 10th. Is that your understanding of the plea agreement? Yes. And have any other promises been made to you to get you to plead guilty today? No. All right. You understand that the sentencing range would be a low, a low term. The lowest possible term you could get is 12 years, with a maximum possible term of 18 years. And you would present your evidence to the court. Mr. Owens would do the same. And I would make a decision as to what the appropriate sentence would be, but it would be no less than 12 years and no more than 18 years. Is that your understanding of the plea agreement? Yes, Your Honor, and I, I pray to God that you give me 12 and I can go home to my family as soon as possible, Your Honor. Understand, and I will hear argument that your attorneys will make that would uh, attempt to convince the court that 12 years is appropriate. Now, I need you to fully understand, I need to listen to me, that you could get 18 years, all right? You, you could get 18 years, you could get 12 years, and you could get anything in between. The way the plea is set up, you could have a sense of 12 years, 13 years, 14 years, 15 years, 16 years, 17 years, or 18. You have to be prepared for the court to impose any one of those possible sentences. Do you understand that? Okay. Has anyone threatened you in any way to get you to plead guilty today? No. Okay. And you understand that by pleading guilty, you avoid the possibility of spending the rest of your life in prison. You understand that? Uh, can you say that one more time? By pleading guilty under these terms, you avoid the possibility of spending the rest of your life in prison. Yes, Your Honor. And you understand? That's, I would imagine that's probably a motivating factor, correct? It is. Okay. All right, so do you have a full understanding as to the nature of the plea bargain and the terms of the plea bargain? Yes. Okay, do you have any questions for the court about the plea agreement and or the sentencing range? Have one moment, yeah. Yes. I have no questions, Your Honor. Okay. All right. And do you need to talk to your attorneys more? He has done so. Okay. All right. Then I need to advise you the maximum terms. The maximum term of this plea, as I mentioned, is 18 years, along with a fine of $10,000 and a possibility of a life parole period. Do you understand that? Yes. All right. You also understand that you would become eligible for the sexually violent predator law, which means that you could have a commitment after you serve your term for this case. Uh, if you are eligible and uh, the, the people file a petition. Do you understand that? Yes. Okay. And you've discussed that with your attorneys as well? Yes. All right. Uh, you also understand that if you are not a U.S. citizen, that this plea will result in the deportation exclusion from the United States and denial of naturalization. Are you aware of that? Yes. All right. Now, I, I also have to go through your constitutional rights with you. Do you understand that the offenses that you are pleading guilty to are serious and violent felonies in the state of California? And in the future, if you commit another felony offense, your conviction in this case will result in substantially increased penalties and a mandatory state prison commitment and a denial of probation. Are you aware of that? Yes. Okay. Do you also understand that you do have the right to a public and speedy jury trial? In other words, you do not have to plead guilty if you don't want to today because you do have constitutional rights including the right to have a speedy and public trial by jury. In order to enter this plea, you have to give up that right. Do you understand that you have the right to a speedy and public jury trial? Yes. And do you give up that right so that you can enter a plea of guilty? Do you give up 
about that right? Um, because you don't have to if you don't want to. As I said, we have jurors out there waiting, and they are willing and able to try this case. And it involves you having to waive your rights to a jury trial for me to, in order to accept this plea. I guess I have to, Your Honor. No, you don't have to. It's your decision. As I said, we have the jurors out there waiting. Both sides are prepared to give their opening statements. And if, if you want to insist on your right to a jury trial, we are ready to give you a jury trial right now.
Uh, Your Honor, I would, I would like, I would like to waive my right for a jury trial. Okay. And let me explain why I'm asking these questions. As a judge, my most important task is to make sure your constitutional rights are being protected. All right. And I cannot accept the plea of guilty unless I can make a finding that you are making a knowing, voluntary, and intelligent waiver of your constitutional rights. So that's why I'm asking these questions. And I cannot accept a plea of guilty from you unless you waive your right to a jury trial. And that's entirely up to you. If you don't want to waive your right to a jury trial, you will get your jury trial. So you understand that you do have the right to a speedy and public jury trial to address whether or not these uh, charges can be proved beyond a reasonable doubt? Yes. And do you now give up that right to a speedy and public jury trial so that you may enter a plea of guilty? Is there any way I could get a couple minutes or no? Well, I'm hesitant to do that because we have the jury out there waiting now and uh, we started these discussions this morning. But I will give you, I'll give you a short period of time, but I don't, I don't want to let those jurors sit out there and wait any longer because I think the DA has their witnesses here. They're ready to start the trial. And I, Mr. Winslow, I felt like I gave you ample time to discuss this over, to discuss this with your with your attorneys. I know that you had family members in here over lunch hour yes, that were present during the conversation as well. So I want to afford you the opportunity to make this very important decision. So why don't, I, why don't we take a short recess? We'll be in recess uh, till 1.45. But I'm going to also ask you some other questions, Mr. Winslow. I'm going to ask you if you give up your right to confront and cross-examine witnesses. I'm going to inform you your right to remain silent, that you can testify on your own behalf if you'd like to. And you also have the right to present evidence on your own behalf and use the subpoena power of the court to subpoena witnesses to come in and testify. Those are all essential constitutional rights that you have. Unless you're willing to waive those rights, I cannot accept your plea of guilty. So we'll be in recess till 1.45. Uh, can uh, counsel, I'll have counsel go back with you and talk with you some more, but we need a decision by 1.45. And I know it might appear that I'm rushing you, but we've, had, we've been talking about this all morning. I, I have to be mindful of the jurors that, uh, that have been sitting out there waiting. So we'll be in recess till 1.45. We'll be in recess till 1.45. We'll see you then.
being outside the presence of the jury. All counsel are present. The defendant is present. And uh, Mr. Winslow, have you have you had some time to discuss this with your attorneys? Yes. Again, and I I I know it seems like I may be rushing you, but we have the uh, jurors out there waiting, and we've been talking about this all morning long. And I like I said, I gave you two and a half hours uh, to over the lunch hour and. I made the courtroom available for you, and I think your your mom and dad were present. Uh, yes, right? Your Honor. Yes. Okay, and that's why I want to. I know it's a very important decision for you, and it may seem like you're being rushed, but I we need to make a decision because I just talked to counsel. Mr. Owens, are you ready to give your opening statement? I am. All right, and Ms. Von Helms, are you ready to give your opening statement? I am, Your Honor. If this, if you do not want to waive your rights, we are going to start this jury trial right now, and both sides are prepared to proceed. And. Uh, if you do not waive your right to a jury trial, you're going to have a jury trial. Do you understand that? Yes. Okay. So I need to ask you, do you understand that you do have the right to a public and speedy jury trial? Yes. I'm sorry? Yes, I do. And do you, do you now give up that right so that you can enter a plea of guilty to count six and count nine and waive your appellate right to the charge that you've been previously convicted on? Yes. Okay. You also have the right to confront and cross-examine all witnesses against you. That's a constitutional right that you have. Do you give up that constitutional right so that you can enter a plea of guilty to these two charges? Yes. You also have the right to remain silent unless you choose to testify on your own behalf. Uh, do you give up that right so that you can enter a plea of guilty to the two charges? Yes. You also have the right to present evidence on your own behalf and use the subpoena power of the court to compel witnesses to come forward and testify on your own behalf. Do you understand that you have that right as well? Yes. Do you now give up that right so that you can enter a plea of guilty to these charges? Yes. All right. Do you also understand that between now and sentencing, if you commit another crime, that the sentencing portion of this agreement will be canceled and I will be uh, allowed, uh, able to sentence you uh, to a greater term in prison and you will not be able to withdraw your plea of guilty. Do you understand that? Can you repeat that once again? Yes, yeah, so uh, if, if you end up committing guilty today, we're gonna set your sentencing out to some date in February. If between now and February, you commit another crime while you're in custody and there are crimes that are committed while in jail that your, your plea will remain, but the court would not be limited to the 18 year lid. The court could sentence you to more than 18 years. That's only if you commit a new offense between now and the sentencing date. Do you understand that? Oh, I understand. Right, and you initial that box. It's called a cruise waiver, and okay. uh, you initial that box. All right, so you agree to that, correct? Yes. And there are a number of other consequences to the plea that you circled in paragraph number 70, or I'm sorry, 7F. Do you understand all those collateral consequences of the plea, the possible consequences of your plea? Yes. All right. Do you have any other questions of the court before the court accepts your plea of guilty? You said, do I have any more questions? Do you have any, do you have any questions of the court about your plea? Yeah. No. All right. Do you own, possess, or have under your custody or control, any firearms, ammunition, or ammunition feeding devices, including but not limited to magazines? Do you have any of those in your possession or within your control? No. All right. Okay, then, uh, Mr. Winslow, let me ask you this. With respect to count six, which, is alleged, which alleges on or about between June 20th, 2003 and June 21st, 2003, you didn't unlawfully and have and accomplish an act of sexual intercourse with Jane Doe, number four, a 17 year old minor, and a person not your spouse when the person was at the time unconscious of the nature of the act and this was known to you. How do you plead to count six? Guilty or not guilty? Guilty. And with respect to count nine, which is an added count that alleges on or about. March 17, 2018, you did unlawfully commit sexual battery against Jane Doe number one, a 50-year-old, 54-year-old woman. How do you plead to that? Guilty or not guilty? Guilty. I'm sorry? Guilty. Okay. 
And also, do you agree then that the verdicts that were recorded on June 10th with respect to Jane Doe number two, Jane Doe number three, and Jane Doe number five will stand and you waive your appellate rights with respect to your convictions in those cases, those charges? Yes. All right. The factual basis reads as follows. With respect to count six of the second amended consolidated information, I unlawfully had sexual intercourse with Jane Doe number four when we were both teens. She was 17, I was 19, and she was not my spouse. She was at the time unconscious, and I do not dispute her memory for purposes of this plea. Did you, in fact, do that, those facts, that make you guilty of this crime? So I'm just not thinking very clearly. Right okay, now. so, well, I read that the factual basis was on the change of plea form that you initialed. And as I, I just read it to you, it alleges that you did certain acts that formed a basis for your conviction of count six. So I need a factual basis for this crime, but if you don't want to admit to a factual basis, we don't have to take the plea. And both sides are ready to proceed with your trial. I'm not pressuring you, I'm just reciting what's on the change of plea form that you already uh, initialed. If you don't want to agree to those facts, you don't have to. respect to the amended added count number nine, which is the sexual battery, the factual basis states as follows. I touch an intimate part of Jane Doe number one while she was restrained in fear against her will for the purpose of sexual arousal. You admit that you committed those acts that make you guilty of count nine. Um. Yes. All right. Mr. Carlos, do you concur in the plea? Yes, sir. Ms. Von Helm, do you also concur in the plea of your client? Yes, Your Honor. All right. The court finds that the defendant has made a knowing, voluntary, and intelligent waiver of his constitutional <coughs> rights, and the court hereby accepts his plea of guilty to count six, and he added count nine of the amended information. Is there a motion on behalf of the people with respect to the balance? Yes, there, there will be one forthcoming, Your Honor. However, I noted when the court was taking the change of plea that I think we needed admission to the 803F allegation regarding count six. Um, once we could do that, the people are prepared to make a motion to dismiss the balance. That's correct. Uh, there was the allegation with respect to the statute of limitations that's not on the change of plea form, however. There is an allegation under Penal Code Section 803F that the offense involves substantial sexual conduct as defined in Penal Code Section 1203.066B, and that there is independent evidence that corroborates the victim's allegations within the meaning of Penal Code Section 803F. Do you admit or deny that allegation? I, I admit. All right. So the court will accept that admission. Let's have you add it onto the change of plea form and initial it. I'll wait for that now. Mr. Owens, do you want to add it? Or? I can initial it. Okay.
you have to change the plea form then? Uh, yeah, he's going to have to waive it. Okay. The uh, court notes that the allegation has been added with respect to count six, and the court did take the admission. With that said, Mr. Owens, is there a motion on behalf of the people for the balance of the information? Yes, thank you, Your Honor. The people move to dismiss the balance in light of the plea to the uh, two counts that are listed on the voluntary plea form. All right, those remaining counts will be dismissed. The uh, case is referred to probation for a uh, sentencing report. We did discuss sentencing dates and we have agreed on February 18th. Is that correct, Ms. Von Helms? That is correct, Your Honor. And Mr. Yeah. Carlos? 19th. I believe we agreed on uh, Wednesday the 19th, if that's possible. That's fine. That'll work. Okay. So probation hearing and sentencing will be on February 19th. Mr. Winslow, you do have the right to be sentenced within 20 days of today's date. Do you give up that right so that instead your sentencing can be heard on February 19th? The year 2020, it'll be at 9 o'clock in the morning? Yes. Okay, we'll show a time waiver then to February 19th with respect to a scheduling for any filings you might want to do. The deadline will be January 31st, uh, 2020, the close of business. All written motions and supporting documents and support of your arguments for sentencing must be filed by January 31st. All responses are then due February 7th by close of business, and then we will have the sentencing on February 19th. That will be at uh, 9 o'clock in the morning in Department 12 up here in North County. All right? 9 a.m., uh, Your Honor? Huh? What? 9 a.m., Your Honor? 9 a.m., yes. Department 12, 9 a.m. The defendant will be held without bail pending sentencing. Are there any further requests with respect to the plea? No, we have to right. Let's bring the jury. record reflect that all jurors are now present. I know this trial is just at the beginning. It's been marked by a bunch of delays. I know you've been waiting out there for a half hour. I'm about ready to tell you why you've been waiting so long. Since this morning, we were having some discussions about a possible change of plea. And while you were away at lunch, that has taken place. So we just took a plea of guilty to certain charges. And what does that mean for you? It means that you do not have to serve on this case and that your jury service is complete. I know I've been admonishing you 
repeatedly. I know it's a lot of you started your jury service two weeks ago today, right? Some of you were here two weeks ago Monday, some of you two weeks ago Tuesday, and two weeks ago Wednesday. And I've repeatedly admonished you not to talk about the case with anybody, not to read any news accounts of the case, not to look at any newspaper articles. You are now released from that admonition because there is no need for a jury trial. Now you might think to yourself, well gosh, I just wasted two weeks of my life sitting around outside the courtroom and inside the courtroom asking questions that are very personal in nature about your background and so forth to make sure that uh, we could get a fair and impartial jury. We started with 172 jurors and ended up with 16. Both sides agreed that you could all be fair and impartial in this case. And I want to give you my thanks for being willing to serve on this case. There are, as citizens, there's only two mandatory things that we must do, duties as citizens. One is to pay taxes, and the other one is jury service. Uh, voting is even voluntary. Military service is voluntary. But this is the one opportunity that you have as a citizen to fulfill your duty that does not involve writing a check to the government uh, that really fulfills your obligation as citizens. I want to tell you how much I appreciate that and how much I appreciate the time that you've taken from your day away from your families, away from your jobs. Some of you who are retired, I'm sure you'd rather be out playing golf. We took time away from the golf course, but I really want to let you know how much we appreciate your willingness to serve on a case certainly of this magnitude and to try and keep your head pointed away from the TV set and the newspapers. So thank you again for your willingness to serve. You are no longer bound by my admonition. You can talk about the case with anyone you want, and the case is over. So your jury service is complete with the thanks of the court. So have a nice day. Thank you very much. see everybody back here February 19th at 9 o'clock in the morning in Department 12. Are there any further requests by the people? Not at this time, Your Honor. I would just uh, let the court out and estimate that in terms of the people's presentation that the estimate for that hearing may take up to an hour. Okay. And it would, it would take probably an hour to two hours. At the moment. I'm going to set a half-day time estimate for the hearing on the 19th. Are there any further requests by the uh, defense? No, Your Honor. No? Okay. I'm sorry? No, you're not. Okay, good luck, Mr. Winslow. We'll see you back in court on February 19th. We're in recess. Thank you, Your Honor.
Good morning. Good. Good. Hottest question, name, spelling, and title. All that fun stuff. My name is Dan Owens. I'm a deputy district attorney. The spelling is D-A-N, last name O-W-E-N-S. I'm assigned to our Sex Crimes and Human Trafficking Division. Council, what's your reaction to the change of plea? I think that Mr. Winslow's acknowledgement of guilt as it relates to the additional two victims uh, was completely appropriate based upon the evidence that we had in this case. I'm satisfied that now Mr. Winslow has been held accountable for his conduct involving five separate victims over the course of 15 years. I have spoken to the victims a number of times, especially since the uh, trial that we proceeded on in May and June of this year, and the victims are supportive of this type of a resolution. So I will allow defense counsel to respond to when it was that they first uh, decided to engage in those types of discussions with their uh, client and his family. Um, I was told this morning that they had worked hard over the weekend to discuss with Mr. Winslow uh, the parameters of a potential change of plea, and it was not until this morning that they offered the specific resolution that uh, ultimately we agreed to. Mr. Owens, can you say what he pleaded to today and does that effectively end this case in terms of uh, prosecution? Not Today, Mr. Winslow pled guilty to the rape of an unconscious person involving Jane Doe number four. She is the 17-year-old victim who, when Mr. Winslow was 19, uh, had non-consensual sex with her while she was unconscious at the time of the act. Uh, that occurred on June 20th of 2003. He also pled guilty to his acts with Jane Doe number one on March 17th of last year, 2018, and he has pled guilty to a felony sexual battery. Essentially, he has admitted to touching the intimate part of Jane Doe one while she was unlawfully restrained against her will. That was a new charge, right? Because it was added. Can you explain why that was added? So what the defense did is they offered a plea to a felony sexual battery involving Jane Doe one in lieu of the felony uh, sexual assault charges that he was facing uh, for those sa that same conduct. Uh, the people were willing to uh, agree to that particular charge. Uh, while it does add less time in terms of uh, his prison exposure, we thought that the overall parameters of an 18-year maximum exposure was appropriate. I think you just answered, but I was going to ask you, what was your motivation for this, this plea deal? The way I looked at it and the way that uh, our internal discussions within my office took place was that he was facing nine years in prison as a result of the conviction counts at trial. We presented the best case we could possibly present involving each one of our five victims. He has now uh, been held accountable for conduct with all five sex, uh, sexual assault victims, and we have now doubled the potential exposure that he's facing to 18 years. Can you talk about what the Um, according to the California Constitution, each one of these victims has an absolute right to be heard regarding sentencing, and they, I will inform them of their ability to come forward and either make an actual victim impact statement to the court um, in, during our sentencing proceeding, or if they so choose, they can also write a letter that I could submit on their behalf or perhaps read it on their behalf. Was part of the reason for accepting this plea deal so that they didn't have to go through the entire experience again? Well, I can only applaud each one of our uh, five Jane Doe's who've come forward and spoken to law enforcement, been grilled on the witness stand, and still stood strong knowing that the truth was on their side. So the fact that they've already gone through this process and seen it through all the way to this point, I think uh, they, deserve, they are deserving of our profound thanks. Uh, in terms of whether or not we uh, factor that into uh, the acceptance of the plea, I do believe that there is some value in allowing this case to proceed to a resolution without having the victims have to go through that arduous task again. He's already been convicted of some charges. Can you talk about what happens with those and um, what happens with the balance of the charges that he had faced? 
So in terms of the charges that he was convicted on, he was convicted of a forcible rape involving Jane Doe II, the indecent exposure involving Jane Doe III, and the uh, lewd act in public in involving Jane Doe V. Those convictions stand. And as part of this uh, plea agreement, he is waiving any right to appeal or challenge any one of those convictions going forward. So those will stand, and they will also be factored into the ultimate prison exposure of the up to 18 years in state prison. Um, in terms of the balance of the charges, those are now dismissed for purposes of his change of plea, and we will not proceed with them uh, at this time, nor would we be able to so long as the sentencing goes forward as expected. Can you explain? Oh, sorry, I just want to question. Will he face a um, possible lifetime registry sex offender that was part of the first charge, first trial? There are additional consequences to his change of plea other than the 18 years in prison. In, in addition, he is going to be a mandatory lifetime sex offender registrant. Uh, that uh, is a mandatory requirement for each of the charges for which he's been convicted. Um, also, as the court mentioned at the time of the change of plea, he does face a possible commitment as a sexually violent predator to an indeterminate term, meaning for the rest of his life, into a state hospital if he is found to meet that criteria and we proceed with a petition to have him committed to a state hospital. That would not be a determination that would be made until he is eligible for parole at the time of his potential release from state prison. So he will not be automatically released into the community until he has been evaluated by two uh, psychologists appointed by the state. Additionally, as you heard the court state, he does face a possible life parole term as a result of his convictions for these offenses. You seem to really struggle with this decision. He kept going back and forth and hesitating quite a bit. Did that surprise you, and what do you make of this? I'm not going to comment on Mr. Winslow's uh, demeanor at the time of the change of plea. I think that both sides agree that this is a fair and appropriate resolution. And if anything, I think that Mr. Winslow's willingness to accept responsibility for the things that he has done uh, does show through, uh, and ultimately he's uh, been held accountable. Can you explain the forcible, um, I'm sorry, the uh, rape of an unconscious teen and why that is not considered a forcible rape? Can you give us some of the for that? Okay, so in California law, there are multiple ways in which a rape can occur, uh, one of which would be by force or fear, with, uh, which is what he has been charged with involving both Jane Doe's 1, 2, as well as Jane Doe 4. Uh, there is also the rape of an unconscious person, which is a different subsection under the penal code. Um, that simply uh, requires that the uh, person, the victim, be unconscious of the nature of the act or asleep at the time of the incident, uh, while it is known to the defendant that they are unconscious of the nature of the act. By statute, meaning our legislature has declared that the rape of an unconscious person does not qualify as a violent felony as defined in the penal code which simply impacts the type of credits that they receive for the time they spend in custody and its prior ability. It is a strike offense and it is a serious felony, but is not a violent felony in the same way that a forcible rape is. And that's so, why you think he was fairly life in prison? So in order to have him serve a uh, potential imprisonment in life for, pardon me, a potential life imprisonment, uh, he would uh, have to have not only multiple forcible rape convictions, but also have the jury make a finding that that allegation is true, meaning that there were multiple victims um, that he stood convicted of. In this case, because the jury, the first jury, found him guilty involving Jane Doe II, and the second jury would then have to make a finding of guilt on Jane Doe either one or four, they'd also have to find the special allegation true to make him face 15 to life in prison. In striking this deal, was it imperative to the district attorney's office that all five victims be admitted to? Uh, that was one of the things that we considered was the fact that he was accounting for his conduct for every single one of the victims. Uh, like I said, these victims uh, came forward reporting what Mr. Winslow had done without even knowing who Mr. Winslow was, with the exception of Jane Doe 4. Um, Jane Doe 4, of course, had a prior relationship with him and knew him back when they were teenagers. But each of these victims, they didn't come out here in order to try to, to frame Mr. Winslow or to you know, go after him in any way. I think that was borne out during the course of the trial proceedings previously. Um, so the fact that they had that courage to come forward and speak with law enforcement and testify to all the things that he had done while facing all of these cameras, I think uh, it was important to me uh, to make sure that that truth was heard and it was important to me to make sure that he was held accountable for each one of those crimes. Did you talk to uh, all five to tell them about the police? Or were they all aware of all three? Or? 
I have not spoken to a single one of the victims uh, today because, of course, I've been in court and I've been in front of all of you. But that is my next step, is I'm going to call each and every one of them and meet in person with those who are here now. So this talk of change of plea really started as far as you were concerned. They first approached you or this developed this morning? The first time that I uh, was aware that they intended to offer a change of plea was this morning. Is that why Mr. Winslow Sr. is not looking at me? I'm not going to comment on Mr. Winslow Sr.'s demeanor in court. I understand that he is under a great deal of emotional stress at this time, just as any father would feel. Were any of the Jane Doe 2 testify today or tomorrow? Did we try that? The expectation was that Jane Doe 2 was going to testify this afternoon, and she's prepared to do that. What was the conversation like with her about the plea? I have not spoken directly with her yet. Um, our victim advocate has done an incredible job of working with Jane Doe 2. Um, I am particularly appreciative of everything that she's done in coming forward and going through this process with me. Um, so I will be speaking with her directly as soon as we're done. Will you be asking for 18 years? Um, I am going to evaluate everything that is being submitted on behalf of the defense. Uh, typically what happens in a case like this when there is a potential range of imprisonment, uh, the defense will submit a mitigation packet. They will file a formal motion trying to mitigate uh, his culpability for the offense. Um, it's anticipated that much of that will include psychological information uh, regarding his psychological history and any potential psychological conditions that he has. I'm not going to commit to the specific number that I'm going to request until I've reviewed that. Uh, last question for me. Was the jury at this retrial, were they going to hear anything about out-of-state incidences? So the court, uh, Judge Bowman, did rule that it would, he was tentatively inclined to allow admission of a 2013 incident involving a woman in a Target parking lot where Mr. Winslow was reported to have engaged in masturbation while seated in his vehicle and uh, mumbled something to her that she did not hear. She reported that incident to police and the police contacted him uh, that evening and found uh, a container of Vaseline within his vehicle. The court, uh, indicated during our motions that he would hear from that victim in the context of a hearing outside the presence of the jury, but that assuming the victim testified consistent with the police reports on the issue, that he was inclined to allow that to be received into evidence. Was that propensity evidence? That would come in uh, similar to the 314 or the indecent exposure involving Jane Doe 3, the gardener who lived down the street. Uh, it would come in for the same reason as propensity evidence under evidence code section 1108. That was in New Jersey. It was in East Hanover Township, New Jersey. Uh, what do you think the message, what, what, what is the message you want to send with this outcome to uh, other survivors of sexual violence? Um, I would just encourage anyone who has ever been the victim of any type of crime, especially one involving sexual violence, to come forward. Uh, even though many years may have passed, uh, ultimately the truth does come to light and they should be encouraged by this type of result. Uh, the people really did attempt to put their best foot forward in the prosecution of this case. Uh, we respect the community's decision in that first trial, and we are relieved that he has now been found guilty of sex crimes involving each one of the victims who did come forward. Could you talk a bit about the, um, how this case involves such a well-known um, you know, football player and, and how the victims were victims that you know, I don't believe that this case should be treated any differently by virtue of the status of the person who's involved. It doesn't matter if the defendant is someone who's particularly well-known or wealthy um, or, if it's some, or if it involves a victim who uh, might be on the, the margins of society. I think that this was a very clear case uh, in which uh, a person decided to engage in sexually violent predatory conduct directed at people who were at the time vulnerable. Um, but that is no different than many of the crimes that we see in San Diego and many of the crimes that I've prosecuted in the past. And I would not treat Mr. Winslow any differently than I've treated any other criminal defend defendant. I respect uh, Mr. Winslow's right to a fair trial, and I believe that I've uh, proceeded with this prosecution ethically and fairly at all times. To be clear, um, your first notification that there was interest in the change of plea was this morning. Um, can you say whether you approached them previously and they were responding to that or was this from them? 
We, we have never had any specific discussions about a potential change of plea other than um, some offhanded remarks while discussing the case off the record in chambers discussions previously. Um, this was the first time that specific counts and specific uh, exposures were discussed was just this morning. And we were prepared to go forward with trial knowing that Mr. Winslow was facing a life term in prison. You know, Mr. Winslow faced rape, oral cop, and kidnap with regard to Jane Doe 1. He's pleaded down to felony sexual battery. That's correct, right? That is correct. Why, why go from those charges to felony sexual battery? I think that uh, based upon the jury split of having seven jurors in favor of guilt and five jurors in favor of not guilty in the first trial, that factored into our determination of whether or not to try to uh, continue to prosecute him for the greater charges. Uh, I think that that is a fair resolution given the evaluation of the community uh, with regard to the incident involving Jane Doe 1. How easy or difficult was the decision for you? It's a difficult decision to make because I think that, uh, as I said in the prosecution of the first trial, this uh, was particularly troublesome conduct. It was, it's, he posed a rather unique danger to the community uh, in the way that he had engaged in recidivist acts. Um, but ultimately, I think that this is a fair and appropriate resolution. Uh, I think that I have the full support of my office uh, in making that determination. And ultimately, it was not my determination to make, uh, but I am in support of it. Any other questions? Thank you, guys. Hmm? You said oh, it was not yours to make. Your decision. It's not mine. Yeah, so it is. Of course. Is there any warning? Yep. Feels like a prom picture. Prom we'll start with name, yeah. spelling, and titles. Right. Uh, Gretchen Von Helms on behalf of Kellen Winslow. That's a small V O N capital H E L M S. Mark Carlos, M A R C C A R L O S. So, how did this plea deal come about? Well, as you can imagine, uh, I've been with this case for a while. There was a previous trial. Uh, we know the testimony of the witnesses that are coming up. Essentially, Mr. Winslow had um, you know, some issues that he could have litigated at trial, but the downside of any conviction uh, would land him in prison for the rest of his life. And he made a decision based upon his family, uh, his father, uh, his children, and he wanted to be there for them in the future. So by accepting a, a plea agreement with the, with the sentencing range that he has, uh, he, he's got a set number that he has to get to rather than spending the rest of his life in prison. Well, I mean, any time that you have, uh, you know, I mean, 
if you've never been in jail before and you have to look at a sentence that puts you in state prison, I mean, ladies and gentlemen, state prison is, in California, it's state prison. It's, it's, it's like they show in movies and TV. I mean, so it's not a nice place to be. So you have to make a, a decision and it weighed heavily on him. And, you know, as you can tell, it, as you watched him, uh, he, it was really difficult for him to make. It's a seriously contested issue. So mm -hmm. this is a young man. He's relatively young and he is making a decision after he has gone to trial already and litigated each of these counts now he's making a decision to resolve it because this plea deal was never on the table before there was never an issue where he would not have to plead guilty to forcible rapes this plea deal allowed him not to have to plead guilty to forcible rapes and, and how much did his family uh, play a role in this decision well, I mean, he, he looked to them for support, and, uh, you know, they, they clearly, because they have a, a role in it also, because it affects, any time any criminal defendant gets sentenced, it affects not only them, but their family, their, their parents and their, their children, and that was a big deal here. Mark, Gretchen, how long, when did you guys first start discussion, discussing a possible plea deal? Well, um, I think that's difficult to say, I mean, because there's, you're always discussing plea deals, so it, or some type of uh, disposition. But it really didn't come to, to as you can tell, it really fruition. didn't fru fruition until today. And he seemed to waver when pressed by the judge. Did you get that impression? No. Well, yeah, I mean, well, what was your impression of, of well, his reaction? It's, it's like I said, you know, it's a momentous decision. This is a, a man who has no criminal history you know, except for you know the, the first trial, there was convictions there. But he's, it's it's a decision that you make. Nobody wants to go to, to jail, but then again, you weigh it against a life in prison sentence. And you know, life in prison in California means just that you go to prison for life. And so that's the problem that he was having. I mean, there was an issue of whether he want. There was issues that he wanted to litigate, but there were risks that weren't worth taking. Mr. Carlos, do you still think he's innocent? You fought through an entire trial with your client uh, espousing his innocence. Now he said, I've done it. Do you think that he was just weighing that? What's your perspective? Well, my, my job as an attorney, I represent individual defendants. I do my best job for them. I, you know, my job is their advocate. So I do what I have to do to represent an individual. He's shifted the, he's shifted the focus of the representation at this point, And I will do, myself and Ms. Von Helms, do everything we can to get the least amount of time possible for in jail. So what I believe really isn't an issue. What were some of the issues you were looking forward to litigating? Well, Jane Doe 1 and Jane Doe 4, uh, those were serious cases of, you know, we believe there were some credibility issues and we were going to exploit them. Again, remember, these are these were already, they had transcribed testimony. We all saw their testimony. So I, I thought those were going to be good cases. But it sounds like uh, that you also thought you could not win at least I didn't say I didn't think we could win. <laughs> no. But no, we did a mathematical computation. And so with the mathematical computation of the conviction that's already present, so that's nine years with the counts already there, to add nine to get to 12 is a small fraction to step up in exchange for dismissing counts in which he could receive life. And understand that the, any lawyer can be as confident as they, they want. They can say, look, we can win this case. I can guarantee you I can win this case. But at the end of the day, you know, we go home. And the client's the one who, you know, suffers our, our, mis, our miscalculation. So we put our, the case in the best position for the client to make the right choice. And that's Where's what happened. What's the biggest hole in the case for the prosecution? I know you've mentioned credibility, but can you put that in a nutshell for us? Well, anybody who saw the first trial could see that there were a huge credibility, we believed to be huge credibility issues. That's why juries couldn't reach the determinations that they did. And so it, it was always a factual case, and there was always factual disputes uh, as to the, the Jane Doe's in this case. And that's what we were going to attack this is vigorously if we went to trial. If you, as you move to sentencing, what are the notes that you're going to play in front of the judge? What well, do you want to really highlight? One of the things we couldn't do for this trial, and I'm sure that people would like to know this, is that it, you know he, he, does, he does suffer from um, some frontal lobe damage as a result of playing football, otherwise known as CTE. It's not admissible in criminal cases regarding specific intent charges, which, is, uh, which are the, the rape charges in this uh, kidnapping and uh, the specific intent. I mean, general, I'm sorry. It's not admissible for the general intent. Right. 
and it's admissible for specific intent, for not general intent. The rapes are general intent, so we could not bring in the uh, the mental defense. And so for the sentencing, we can present uh, the evidence that uh, and the the reports that we have uh, for the judge to consider, and, uh, and they're they're uh, they're significant. Can you expand on that? Because I think that's something that we all like to hear more about. I mean, how much of a role does that play with with what happened here? Well, well, you can see that with traumatic brain injury and CTE, that people's cognitive abilities, once they've had, remember, he didn't just have football head injuries and impact from football, he also suffered a severe motorcycle accident. If you remember his career, he was involved in a severe motor motorcycle accident, um, which ripped his leg apart, and he had to rebuild that leg to be able to play. And that took dedication and drive to be able to overcome those serious injuries. But once you have a traumatic brain injury, you might look and talk kind of normal, to, but once you're tested for that and you have those cognitive impairments, it really impacts your frontal lobe. And that's what we're going to be showing to the judge. And he has been tested for those? He has been tested. Yes. He's been tested. We've, we've had him evaluated. You know, and, and it's not a, a defense in the criminal case to some of the charges that we have here. So, but they are factors in mitigation that the judge can consider in in uh, his sentencing. Well, you, have, you, have you, have you have confirmed dead. information that he has had a traumatic brain injury or CTE. That's confirmed. Well, well, you can't confirm it unless you do an yeah. autopsy. Well, so we have to kill is, him and true. then take his brain and slice it open. And we're not going to do that. What, what I can tell you, <laughs> Ar Artie, Artie, what I can tell you is this: I can tell you that we've had him evaluated, and I feel confident that we can present something to the judge, which will outline his his uh, the impact of his football playing career. Does he have a specific diagnosis? Well, it's, it's what we said. If you know about CTE, there is no live di diagnosis for CTE that's available now. There's just there, because there are <coughs> symptoms. Because right, but right. that's what they do. Is they look at the symptoms of known individuals who have died. Right. They have sliced their brains during their autopsies and figured out that they have CTE. And so what, what psychologists and psychiatrists have to look at now for live people that right. may have CTE is to try to evaluate whether they have it based on the symptoms they have that are similar to people who have died and have CTE. So you're right, it is a diagnosis that um, is not final because they have to right. be dead to have the final diagnosis, but it is um, an opinion of a doctor that he does have um, brain injury. Is well, there other images, um, MRE, I mean, uh, MRI, um, MRI images of his brain prior to the crash? I mean, do you have a progression in medical? I, I can't really comment on that right now. I, I will present what we have to the judge. We do have significant medical records. And we'll present what we, we have. Can you talk about how he's doing and even how he has been doing in custody? You, you, I mean, it's I'm, horrible to be in custody. Right, it's horrible to be Nobody in custody. Nobody does well. He's, he's, he's basically in a jail by himself. Uh, he doesn't have access to other inmates, so it's almost, I mean, it, it's not nice for him. I mean, he doesn't, it, he's, he's, he's not, what's the word I'm looking for? It, 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 it's, it's depressing. It's very hard on it's, him. It's yeah. depressing. It's hard on him. Um, it's anxiety producing. It's everything you think a jail cell would be. That's what it is. Yeah. Now, going, oh, sorry, going back to the deal that you were talking about, your question earlier, was the analysis from Jane Doe 1, the prosecution also, as you may have noticed, dismissed all the counts that were previously filed on Jane Doe 1. They filed a new amended account count for sexual battery. And so their dismissal of that also speaks to you as reporters as to what they thought they could win on that case. And they dismissed all those counts for this plea negotiation. So plea negotiations leave both sides vaguely dissatisfied, if you will, and you come together to get the best result for your client, both from the prosecution's point of view and our point of view. He Too struggled bad, so much this morning with that decision. I mean, it was, it was obvious. When did he, when did, when did you start talking to him seriously about this? Because he asked for more time. Oh, no. We can you kind of talk to the, all the cameras in the middle there? Thanks. Oh. OK, thank, thank you. you. So the question was, when we start talking to him? I mean, you're always talking about this, so it's not anything that's new. And so the, the equation of going to trial versus uh, any type of proposed plea agreement, you know, we're always talking about it. So it's not something that's new. But coming to 
the way these things work, is particularly in, in serious cases like this, is you present something to the district attorney as to whether or not they would consider it. And then they go up to the supervisors and decide whether or not that's something, and that's what Mr. Owens did. Uh, he went up his chain of command and came back down, and then we came to some, a number that uh, he could agree to. So that's why the way it works. Why wasn't that done before jury selection? It's what, what he was trying to explain is that's always kind of being done, but then the DA has the option to reject offers to say that that's yeah. not going to work for them. And I think it was after the judge's ruling. So remember, a lot of the judge's rulings got delayed until after the jury was selected. And so it's a process that we're engaging in. And once the judge makes certain decisions about what evidence is coming in and what evidence is going to be kept out, that impacts the DA's decision on what they're going to do with the case, and it impacts our decision. Yeah, I mean, so it, that's why it all comes together at the last minute, oftentimes. Was this off the table once that once that jury went in there and open started? Sure yeah. was. Yep. That's that's why. And so you couldn't. You, did you did you press to try to get? Can we just have overnight? Let him sleep on it. No. no. I mean, there was there was sufficient time. I mean, we we spent almost two and a half hours in a locked cell with him. So yeah, there's plenty of time for him to consider and he knew ahead of time. You know, you just have to realize that these, that this, these things are not just confined to this day. I mean, we have been living, I, and this Van Helms more recently, but I've been living this thing, you know, 24 seven for quite some time. For Kellen and I go, I mean, we know the facts, we know everything about this case. And so it's not something that's done lightly. He you know, took some time. As far as the 12 year minimum, could he get out early for a good behavior? There is good behavior credits, yes, that are allowed by the California Department of Corrections. And so those, what we call good time credits, if they behave themselves in custody, that um, allows the Department of Corrections to adjust the sentence down slightly, not, not in half. massively, no. No, it's not, it's not entitled to half time. It's not half time. It's 85 percent, and then the Department of Corrections has their own, they can, they can reduce slightly under that also. That comes at the sentencing. What were some of the motions uh, or the rulings on some of the motions that weighed in your decision? Well, the motion for new trial was denied. The motion to admit Bobby Guzman's uh, semen was denied. The motion to allow or not to call victims was denied. So there's a lot of yeah. factors that enter into our decision because those were the judge's rulings and that's what we're bound with in right. this jury trial. And, and a critical one was the, the motion for new trial because we believed we had a case that was right on point. I mean, we believed it to be right on point uh, and Mr. Winslow would have to wait to get to an appeal in order to have that reheard again. We took it to the Fourth Circuit, the Fourth District uh, Court of Appeals for a, a writ. We were denied on the writ uh, just within two days of filing it. And so we'd have to go to appeal, and you know it's just two years down the line, and so that's part and parcel of uh, the thinking that went into. But the reason, right, to appeal. He right. Does. and that's the reason why plea deals come together, sort of at the last minute, because you have the prosecution weighing their options, you have the defense weighing their options, and you have the judge making certain decisions about the case, and then we <coughs> abide by those rulings. We follow what the judge tells us to do, and so all that kind of slots into the categories right at the last minute, and that's what happened here. It doesn't mean that Mr. Winslow hasn't been able to hear that that could happen. So you are prepared that this kind of thing will happen close to or at the time of trial. That's when it all starts happening, and we always prepare our clients. This is what's going to come. Maybe this will all slate out one way, or maybe it'll come out the other way. And then you have to make that final decision in those final moments. Even if you've had weeks or months to consider that this might happen, that's the day. That's where the rubber meets the road. And that's where you saw him agonizing and trying to make that decision and make a correct decision for himself and his family. And it gives closure to the victims. That's why the prosecution signed off on this deal, because they no more appeals. It's done. It's over with. And so it's a final decision for everybody, and that's why both parties enter into the negotiations. Does that is make your, sense? Is your medical report from Dr. Faber? Or can you no. We can't comment, can't comment on that. Can't comment. Anybody else? See what kind of symptoms he has related to the type of They are disease. symptoms similar to CTE. Like memory loss? Yep. The whole nine yards. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Oops.